Hey everybody, Tim Krause here. Uh, we're going to go through this video very quickly. I'm calling this one, Is the Jesus of the Message the Jesus of the Bible? Uh, I've done a couple of Facebook posts. I encourage you to go out and take a look at those. That that happened Tuesday this week, Thursday this week, and the Tuesday the following week. It is the uh, 20th of March, 2024 today. So we're going to use the same methodology that we always use, Isaiah 28.10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line here a little and there a little. Then we've got 2 Corinthians 13.1, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Any of the links, any of the videos will be available down in the description block for you to take a look. Go out to the Google Drive, make sure we're not doing anything nefarious uh, or anything that's that's unacceptable. We're going to go through this pretty quickly because there's a lot of material here today, including the videos from some of the message ministers. And and frankly, that's I wanted to draw some attention to why we're doing this today. We're addressing this issue because we've gotten some video clips. I'm going to go through a couple with you, three now. Here's Ronnie Long. This is the 8th of February, 2024. My eternal destination is resting on the authority of the message of this hour. We've got Benjamin Seabolt, 15th of July, 2021. Rejecting the message of William Branham is to reject salvation. Then we've got Tim Pruitt. This one's more current. This is the 21st of January, 2024. Tim explains to us that the Great Commission that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 28 could not possibly have been carried out until now, until this day. So we'll let Tim explain that to you, and then we'll come back and talk about those. But here we go. That somehow we've got to go beyond the messenger somehow, that he didn't have a great understanding, that he didn't have an authority on this. I choose to believe the vindicated word of the hour. I am not ashamed to admit that my, my eternal destination is resting on the authority of the message in this hour. If this is wrong, I'm going to hell. But I believe this is the absolute vindicated truth of the hour, and you will not talk me out of it because a man did not talk me into it. Jesus cared enough for the message of today to bring these same things to pass as he said till he died and rose again to send them by the Holy Spirit. Well, I thought he just died on Calvary for my sins. He did. Well, I accept Calvary. I accept God. I'm a Christian. The prophet of God said Jesus died on Calvary for this message. So if you try to tell me that you can set this message aside but yet still accept Calvary, it doesn't line up. He says he, he cared so much for this message, to bring this message, that he died and rose again to send them by the Holy Spirit. You can't accept one without accepting the other, saints. It is impossible. His ministry today that he's still alive, he cared enough. Won't we care? That's the thing. Won't we care? He died for this ministry. So if you reject this ministry, what have you rejected? You've rejected his death. And there is no way that he can feed you and clothe you and prepare a place for you. Amen. You know, this has not been able to be done through the ages. Amen. Only after the seven seals have been revealed and the word of God handed back with the book given to the people has there come a people on the earth that are authorized now to fulfill the Great Commission. All right, there you have the three ministers. What's interesting to me that I find about some of these video clips, particularly these, are you hear people in the background who are competing to be the loudest amen person in their assemblies. And what they should be saying is, wait, wait, what? You, you said what? But they don't. They, they just follow along. They, they don't think about what it is they're hearing. So we're going to talk about that and help them out a little bit. We've asserted in YouTube videos and in Facebook posts that message ministers who teach the Jesus of the end time message of William Branham are not teaching the, teaching the Jesus, our Lord and Savior, which is found in the Bible. And I want to go through that with you really quickly. 
Now, to understand how we come to that conclusion it, based on reliable information that's available, I want to demonstrate how a methodology can be used to study scripture. Now we're going to get a little bit into this as we're going to we're not going to get too deep. We're just going to use a rudimentary methodology to go through this, okay? What we're going to read the Bible in plain language. What we cannot find in the Bible, we have to go out and research and do other sources historically, but but we don't just take anything that matches our our narrative. Well, you see this is what what apologetics is. This is the science of of actually reading the Bible. You know, I'm going to get a lot of pushback from the message believers who are going to tell me that this is this is educational, that this is you know we that that this is we we don't have a revelation that what we've got is as Tom Ray would say a temporal understanding of the message, but but you see the thing is this. <clears throat> As we go through this process, reliable information is information that can be uh, supported by Scripture and other sources reliably. That is, the vast majority of what we see uh, is, it turns out to be reliable. And in, in other words, we can reproduce the information using Scripture. Okay, so we don't take things that just, you know, gee, that fits our narrative, so we're going to assume that. We have to have reliable information when we go to sources outside of Scripture. Okay, so I want to make that very, very clear. But we're going to use a little bit of a methodology today. I know, I know, methodology sounds like study, and study sounds like education. And according to William Branham, this is him on in 1957. This is the 25th of January, hear ye him. God is looking for somebody who will stand out on the front line with love, not with no education. So I understand we're going to get beat up about this. I get it. But the challenge is that we need some sort of a structure or some sort of an understanding about how to look at Scripture in order to be able to divine truth correctly. And we've got Scripture that supports that. Here's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study, study is the first word, to show thyself approved unto God. Approved unto God. We're to study in order to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy tells us that we have to study in order to write, be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, we're told don't study, just believe, but you see we've got scripture that says something else. So, so we'll examine what an extreme, with an extremely rudimentary methodology. We're not going to go into Six Sigma. We're not going to go into lean. We're just going to go into a very lean, a very rudimentary uh, methodology. And we're going to take a look at an essential doctrine of the end time message of William Branham, which is the church ages. What we're going to do is read scripture in plain language. We're going to take some time to do that. And, and when things are not addressed in scripture, just to reassure you, then we're going to search for reliable information from multiple sources that agree. You see, science is based on reliable information that can be replicated or it can be supported uh, you know, to, you know, with multiple sources, with, with a lot of information or a lot of detail, a lot of data points, okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a look at that. Okay, first things first, we're going to take a look at what William Branham tells us, and I've given you a link in the description block here of this article. This is the Believe the Sign article that talks about the doctrine of the seven church ages. Fundamental doctrine for the end time message of William Branham. The church ages, dispensationalism in the church ages from 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 the second chapter, or from the from uh, second chapter of Acts to the, the rapture, uh, all of that is fundamental. The, those segments that, that William Branham and Larkin and Dowie and Ironside and Schofield and Nelson and Darby and others, all of those things that are church ages, dispensational ages, uh, are fundamental to the message, the end time message of William Branham. So we're going to take a look at that real quick. But um, here's what William Branham said, and this is at 1961. This is uh, July the 30th. This is a morning service, Gabriel's instruction to Daniel. And we took each church age, each time, each thing that happened, each star, each messenger, their nature, 
what they'd done and brought it down through history until the very last one, drawed right there in the picture on the side of the wall. Again, he's talking about when he says that the Holy Spirit came and drew the picture of the church ages on the wall. So we see that Branham also tells us there are seven messengers or seven angels, of which Branham is the seventh. I'm going to read a quote here. 1963, this is March the 17th evening. The breach between the seven church ages and the seven seals. And see the plummet in the hands of Zerubbabel with those, with those seven. These are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. The seven eyes, eyes meaning seer, seeing means prophets, seers. This is William Branham speaking. This lamb had seven horns, and on each horn had an eye, seven eyes. What is it? Christ and his bride, seven church ages. Out of there was seven prophets that went forth, seven seers, eyes. So the last one must be a seer. All right, that was William Branham in 1963. Oops, but wait a minute. Now we've got William Branham a day later. This is March the 18th, 1963. This is the first seals sermon. Here's William Branham speaking. Notice, this last message of the last church age is not a reformer. He is a prophet, not a reformer. So he's calling himself a prophet. Okay, Show me where one prophet ever started a church age. Oh, yesterday, William Branham said that the, that the church age messengers were seers. They were the eyes that went to and fro. They were prophets. Seers means prophets. Here he's saying, nope, nope, nope. That's, show me one prophet ever started a church age. He's not a reformer, he's a prophet. Others was reformers, but not prophets. So here William Branham has changed his mind. Must have gotten a revelation from God. If they would have been, the word of the Lord comes to the prophet. That's the reason they continued on in the baptisms of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and all these things, because they were reformers and not prophets. But yet they were great men of God and saw the need of the day. They lived in and God anointed them and they sent out there and tore these things to pieces. But the full word of God never come to them because they was not prophets, they were reformers. But in the last days, it'll have to be a prophet to take up the mysteries of God. Again, he's speaking of himself. Bring it back because the mysteries was only re known by prophets. So it has to be this fellow come. See what, what I mean now? He can't be a reformer. It's got to be a prophet because it's got to be gifted, somebody that's gifted and set there that catches the word. So we've got, just keep that in mind. We've got a disagreement. First they were prophets. Now they're reformers and he's the only prophets. Why would he say that? Because basically the, pro the people that were the reformers taught things that were directly opposed to Branham's doctrine. Now, we're ta again, we're talking about that very slice of, that very narrow slice of, of dispensationalism between the second acts and the rapture. Okay, but we've got we've got some of the reformers, some of the church age messengers that said that dispensationalism, like the seven church ages, was heresy. We'll leave that alone for another moment, but let's go through this real quickly. Here we go. So I know that everybody watching this video knows this chart really, really intimately. I'm going to go through it very, very quickly. This is the seven church ages as defined by William Branham. Oops, I mean Larkin. And William Branham bothered it. Now, here's the challenge. It, we see, we've seen in previous quotes where William Branham just, he, everything was a special revelation from God. Okay? All of a sudden, we're taking information that came from other people, and he's just tying up loose ends. So we've got some di misunderstanding or some disagreement about what exactly, is it loose ends or was it a special revelation from God? Let's leave that aside for the moment. We have the Ephesus church age from 53 to 170 AD. The messenger is Paul, born roughly 5 AD, died roughly 68 AD, as best as we can tell. When we say circa, that we, we don't have great information, but we can come as close as we can. Here we've got the Smyrna church age, 170 to 312 AD. The messenger is Irenaeus. He was born around 130 AD, died around 200 AD. Pergamos church. 312 to 606 AD, the messenger is Martin, was born roughly 316 AD, died in 397, this we know, 397 AD. Then we've got the Thyre Tyre Church Age, which is interesting. We've got a 606 to 1520 AD, the messenger is Columba, who was born in 521 and died in 597. We know this to be true, and yet 
the Thyatira church age didn't start till 606. So here we have a messenger, a reformer, that wasn't even in his church age, but <clears throat> I digress. Then we've got the Sardis church age, 1520 to 1750 AD. The messenger is Martin Luther from 1483. He died in 1546. Philadelphia Church Age, 1750 to 1906. The Messenger is Wesley, 1703 to 1791. Then we've got the, or excuse me, he died in 1806, pardon me. Then we've got the Laodicean Church Age, uh, or excuse me, 1906. Then we've got the Laodicean Church Age, that 1906 to present day, the messenger there is William Branham. Now you notice in the previous quote, we're going to talk about the previous quote for just a minute. In the previous quote here, the one where he teaches the first seal, William Branham says, show me where one prophet ever started a church age. If you take a look at all of these reformers, reformers slash prophets, whichever you prefer to call them, if you take a look at them and you take a look at the dates of their birth and death, as it relates to the church ages, well, guess what? They're out at the beginning. We even got Columba, who didn't make it quite to his church age. So it looks like William Branham isn't exactly clear as to the reformers starting the church age, because if you take a look at this chart, you see that the reformers or prophets, whichever, did actually start the church age, with the exception of of William Branham. Now we see immediately when we actually sit down and simply read scripture, there are major problems with this explanation, and we've just highlighted some of those, but there are others. So let's go ahead and take a look at the others that we're going to highlight real quickly. How about starting in the very first chapter of the book of Revelation where Branham tells us the church ages come from? We're going to read this in plain language, plain English. Okay, not difficult at all. Here's Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Verse 4, John, to the seven churches in Asia. Now at the time, there were churches in Asia. There were seven of them. And some of these churches had sort of satellite churches or affiliated churches that they, you know, that and, and by the way, Paul planted a lot of these churches. The Apostle Paul planted a lot of these churches. So here we've got John, to the seven churches in Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is coming from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, the glory and dominion are his forever and ever and ever. I want you to notice now, and Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And again, he's talking about kings of the earth in the present day and when, when, uh, when John is there. And we'll talk about why we know it's present day. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. John again speaks, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, what we've got then is, going a little bit further along, as we're still in the first chapter of Revelations, this is verses 17 through 19. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He was laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. Obviously, he's talking about God. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about a Godhead here. Okay? And the living one, I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. So he's talking about Jesus, who died on the cross, descended into hell, and ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of his Father. And I hold the keys of death in Hades. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is, and what will take place. Three distinct time frames. What you have seen, past tense, what is, present tense, and what will take place after this, future or prophetic? 
Okay, and it's important to understand those three distinct time frames when we look at the book of Revelation. Here, Jesus Christ tells us that there are three distinct time frames as we continue to look at the book of Revelations. Let's go a little bit further in the book of Revelations. Now we're in the second chapter. Second chapter, first verse. Write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. Write to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Revelation 2, verse 12. Write to the angel of the church in Pergamum. Revelation verse two verse or chapter two verse eighteen. Write to the angel of the church in Thyatira. Now in the second chapter, each one of those letters to those churches is laid out. But we have some interesting dynamic here. Write to the church angel or write to the angel of the church in Pergamum. Present tense in Pergamum in Ephesus, in Smyrna, in Pergamum, in Thyatira. Let's go a little bit further now into the third chapter of the book of Revelation. Revelation 3.1, write to the angel of the church in Sardis. Revelation 3, chapter, or verse 7, write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Verse 14, write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. These letters were appropriate for the individual churches which were in Asia and all the satellite churches that were around them. And obviously, Jesus had identified some issues within those churches and within the satellite churches that were there as well. This is important because this is where the, the dispensationalists say, you know, gosh, this is where the seven church ages comes from. But, but in plain language, what we've seen here, just reading this is, we, what we don't see here is right to the angel of the church represented by Sardis. We see right to the angel of the church in Sardis. But wait, we're just about to get to the prophetic or the future tense. So far we've been looking at the present tense, in. How do we know we're going to switch now from the present tense for John the Revelator into the future tense for John the Revelator? Here is chapter 4 or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 1. This is again John speaking. After this I looked, and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what may, must take place after this. Let me, let me repeat that. Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. The language that was used when Jesus defined three time frames, what must take place after this. That is, your present tense, now we're going to move into the prophetic or the future tense of the book of Revelation. So, if after Revelation 4.1 is the prophetic in the book, the future tense of the book, verse, verse 1 of chapter 4, then to whom are the letters written to the angels of the churches? Who, who, who did they get written to? Well, you see, chapter 2 and chapter 3 are present tense in John's time. That's why 4 starts out as it does. Now, after this, we're going to go into the prophetic. And what was present tense during John times, John's time on Patmos? And remember, John's time on Patmos, he was on the Isle of Patmos, exiled to the Isle of Patmos in 95 until John's death. Okay, and he died peacefully. He was the, one of the only twelve. He was the only disciple that died without dying a horrific death. He was on the Isle of Patmos in exile. Chapters two and three are present tense in John's time. So let's take a look at what we've got so far. We've got we've got William Branham telling us that there are church ages. We've got him telling us that there are messengers to church ages. We've got him outlining the the church ages and the messengers. He's following the dispensational dis, dispensationalist playbook laid out by Larkin and Dowie and and mostly Larkin, but Dowie and and Darby and Schofield and Ironside and all the rest of the dispensationalists throughout throughout time. Uh, he, he's laying all of that out for us. He's even giving us the names of the messengers. But we've got some issues associated with those. Let's take a look. 
First issue that I want to address is Paul's death. Now, this is important. The Apostle Paul was the first age messenger of the age of Ephesus, according to William Branham. We saw that in the chart. Remember that the Apostle Paul died circa 68 AD. Okay? And there's a there's a link down here that, that is from the uh, the BibleStudy.org question. So this is not a believe the sign thing. There are lots of dates. If you go on the internet and say, when did Paul die? Anywhere between 64 to 68 to 67. I mean, they're all over the board. We don't know for certain when that happened, but we do have reliable information. And remember, we said we were going to capture reliable information about things that we could not find in scripture. Scripture does not tell us exactly when Paul died. Okay. But here's what we've got right in that time frame between 64 and 68 AD. But we've got a pretty good handle on it here in this BibleStudy.org article that I linked. I'm going to quote that here. It says, Paul was likely beheaded by the Romans under Emperor Nero sometime around May or June of 67 AD. Nero himself died by suicide on June the 9th of 68 AD, the same year. All right? So, so that's as close as we can come. Certainly not after 68 AD, because he died under decree by Nero. He was beheaded under decree by Nero, and Nero died on June the 9th uh, of 68 AD. We know this to be true, all right? So what do we know about Paul then? He died prior to that. Okay, and let's say 68, best, worst case scenario for the message, he died, or the best case scenario for the message, he died in 68 AD. Now, why do I call that the best case? John the Revelator was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, wait for it, hang on, 95 AD. I've linked an article here from Greeka.com. It talks about uh, Patmos in the book of Revelation. I'm going to quote that for you here. Many secular scholars, and again, we don't have an exact date in the Bible, but we do know this from historical evidence, and this is a good indicate. The most reliable information that we can find says, many secular scholars have expressed their doubts on the authorship of the book of Revelation. Nevertheless, most Christian churches maintain that the Revelation was written by St. John, the favorite disciple of Jesus Christ, and the author of the fourth gospel. As he himself says in Revelation 1.9, St. John was exiled to the Pat Isle of Patmos in 95 AD during the persecution of the Christians by the Roman Emperor Domitian, and he was there between 81 and 96 AD. So we come to the 95 AD, best case scenario, would have been 81 AD, but these folks are, you know, pushing this out a little bit to, to 95 AD. So why did we get all of that information? Why did we have to go look for all of that information? Because William Branham claimed that Paul was the me messenger of the first age. He claims that John wrote the letter in the second chapter of Acts, first verse, or excuse me, the third chapter of Acts. He claims that John, or excuse me, the second chapter of Acts, first verse, first verse write this letter to the church in Ephesus to the angel to the messenger which was Paul. The Apostle Paul was dead when John wrote the letter to the angel of the church of Ephesus. So John wrote a letter to the dead guy? Didn't Jesus get the memo? Jesus is telling him to write the letter. Jesus is telling him to write it to the angel of the first church age. Jesus didn't know that Paul had died? He, he, he just didn't get the memo? See how important that is? You see, when we start to take a look at it, oops, they're turning to, now we got issues. Okay? And it, it's the same issues, by the way, that dispensationalists have had since the, you know, although it was Branham who claimed messengers. No other dispensationalist associated messengers with those church ages, reformers or prophets, whichever you prefer. And we know that the word age or ages do not exist throughout the entire book of Revelation. If you do a word search in the book of Revelation, you will not find the words age or ages. And that represents an individual problem as well. 
Now, why is that such a big problem? Well, they're very small words, but they have a huge impact. I'm going to give you an example of why the impact is so, so huge. Here we have Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 through 19. I testify, this is John again speaking, John the Revelator. I testify to everyone who hears the prophetic words of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophetic good book, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city written in this book. That's a pretty dire warning. We take that very, very seriously. Now, Tim, how does this relate to the Jesus of the end time message of William Branham? After all, the topic of this of this video was, is the Jesus of the message the same as the Jesus in Scripture? We used a methodology or study to show that what William Branham taught was at best extra-scriptural. Age and ages does not appear in the book of Revelation and is at worst anti-scriptural. That is to say, when you associate church ages to the churches in the physical uh, in Asia, the physical churches which are located in Asia and their satellite or affiliated churches, when you when you look at the fourth chapter, the first verse of the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation, and John talks about from this point forward is the prophetic, okay, then we begin to understand that what was taught by dispensationalists since eight, from the middle of the 1800s is at best extra scriptural, it's at worst anti-scriptural. So why do message ministers and message believers take what William Branham said and replace scripture with Branham's doctrine? Why is his word taken over the top of what scripture says in plain language like we just showed? You see, when we go back to Scripture, even Jesus Christ tells us what we should believe in truth. Here's John. Jesus Christ tells us this in John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. He's talking to God here. He's talking to his Father. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Here we've got him again, John 14, 15 through 18. If you love me, you'll keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Emphasis is mine. He is the spirit of truth. The truth is unable to receive, or the world is unable to receive him, but it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. Here we've got Jesus Christ again a little bit further down in the 14th chapter, verses 25 through 26. I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, the Father will send him in my name, will teach you all things. The emphasis there is mine. You won't find it capitalized in your Bible. And remind you of everything that I have told you. Then we've got Jesus in the 16th chapter, a little bit further along, verse 6 through 13. Remember, this is Jesus Christ himself speaking. Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away, because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment, about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me, and about judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the Spirit of Truth, verse 13, when the Spirit of Truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Emphasis is mine. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. And then we've got the Apostle Paul who reaffirms this as well. This is Romans chapter 3, verse 4. Absolutely not. We, God must be true. Even if everyone is a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and triumph when you judge. And didn't Branham tell us that he only taught what Paul taught? Here Paul's saying God is true if everybody else is a liar. God's word is true. Jesus Christ has told us that the Holy Spirit is going to be with us forever. So what are the conclusions? What can we draw from all of this? This is where we're going to get down to talking about why we, we did all of that preface, all of that pretext, 
to get to these conclusions. This is where we're going to talk about why the Jesus in the message is different than the Jesus of the Bible. Okay. First conclusion, we see using a simple rudimentary methodology, that's reading the scripture in plain language, okay, that there are no such things as church ages in the Bible. That's an important thing to understand. See, we can talk about all of the doctrines and all of the rest of the stuff. We can talk about, you know, it, look, if there aren't any church ages... And, and this is really the crux of, you know, how do we, you know, William Branham claimed over 400 times in 1,205 sermons that he was a prophet of God, that he was the seventh church age messenger, the prophet to bring God's word to the church, Laodicean church age, which is today. This message of this hour, message of this day. If there are no church ages, then why did William Branham claim to be a prophet messenger to the seventh church age? You see the problem? This, this goes to the fundamentals of whether or not the message of William Branham is actually truth, reliable truth. We know that message ministers and message churches teach repeatedly that there were church ages and that William Branham was the seventh church age prophet messenger in direct conflict with the Holy Scripture that we just showed. So... We also know that message ministers takes Branham doctrine and place it above the very word of God. There are no church age church ages associated with the Bible or defined in the Bible. But William Branham is the church age messenger, therefore there must be church ages. Right? So we we interpolate, we transpose, we read between the lines. We don't read in plain language. We don't take what what's God's given us in plain language in the Bible. Okay? And we replace God's word with Branham's doctrine. We do it in so many areas. It's unbelievable. It it it's, it's unbelievable. And this is really going to get to the crux of the matter. When William Branham taught that he had something different, something different, he received, he replaced the Holy Spirit with his end time message. What am I talking about when I say that William Branham has something different? Here's the quote, 1965. This is just a month before Branham's death, the 25th of November, the invisible union of the bride of Christ. Here's William Branham speaking. The word, now the word that fell on the day of Pentecost, the word, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. We know that the Word is God. The Word that fell on the day of Pentecost. What's the Word that fell on the day of Pentecost? It's the Holy Spirit. The Word that fell on the day of Pentecost will not work for this day. The Holy Spirit will not work for this day. This is a month before he died. Talk about progressive revelation. This is a month before William Branham died. The word that fell on the day of Pentecost will not work for this day. No, sir, that was for Pentecost. This is for the bride, going home of the bride. We got something different. Remember those, remember those scriptural references that we talked about where the Holy Spirit's going to be with us forever. He's going to teach us all things. He's going to lead us into all truth. The word that fell on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, the word that fell on the day of Pentecost is not adequate for this day. William Branham has something different. Now, if the end time messenger, or if the end time message of William Branham in that sermon replaces the requirement for the Holy Spirit, the word that fell on the day of Pentecost, not adequate for this day, not for this day, only for the day of Pentecost. Not for this day. you got to have the message of the hour for this day. Right? So if that word, the Holy Spirit, if, that, if the end time message of William Branham replaces the requirement for the Holy Spirit, or the word which fell on the day of Pentecost, then did Jesus Christ die to usher in a new covenant? Remember, Jesus Christ died on the cross to eliminate the requirement for a high priest and a prophet. Those were old covenant requirements. That was the group think. That was everybody's going to get judged exactly by a nation. When, the, when Christ died on the cross, 
right? Revealing the new covenant, ushering in the new covenant, revealing the whole of holies to everybody, ushering in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus Christ, the conversion experience that leads to salvation according to Acts 2, 37 and 38, okay? Did Christ die in vain? He died to usher in that new covenant. But because William Branham's end time message minimizes the very sacrifice made by Jesus Christ for our sins, then Jesus Christ died in vain. With legalisms, the law, you gotta, you know, don't, you, you, you can't cut your hair. You gotta wear stuff. You can't, you know, guys trim your hair up. You can't wear a beard, right? You can't, I mean, you, you know, when you have legalism, when you've got the law mixed in with the new covenant, the law as, and all the old covenant requirements such as long hair for women, then the new covenant is of no effect. Then, then you're still bound by the old covenant. Then you minimize why Jesus died on the cross to begin with, to eliminate the old covenant. Here we've got Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7 through 13. Verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second for finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The new covenant that showed up when Jesus Christ arrived, when he died on the cross. The house of Israel with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. By the way, this comes from the, the prophets of the Old Testament. And I will put my law into their minds and write them in their hearts, and I will be them to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, for the least from the least to the greatest. Now listen, verse verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their inequities. I will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So, so which Jesus does the end time message of William Branham teach? Well, so certainly not the Jesus of the Bible that taught salvation comes through him alone. Let's take a look as, at an example of this. Here's John 14th chapter, verses 5 and 6. This is Jesus Christ speaking. Lord, Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, Ronnie, when you talk about your salvation depending upon the end time message of William Branham, you might want to reconsider that and consider this scripture uh, as opposed to that. Bottom line is, we know that the message of William Branham, the end time message of William Branham, does not teach the same. Uh, the, does not teach the same Jesus. When you've got something different, other than the Spirit, the Word that fell on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. When you've got something different, and that was William Branham just a month before he passed away, then then you're promoting something other than the Holy Spirit that arrived in Pentecost. What Jesus Christ said is with us forever, will teach us all things, and will lead us into all truth. So we encourage the people in the, in the message to, to discover which Jesus they really believe in. Because we don't, I don't believe that the Jesus that, that William Branham taught, particularly when we're told by Tim Pruitt that the, the Great Commission that Jesus Christ gave to his disciples could not happen until this day. Just after the Great Commission that's described in Matthew chapter 28, you got Paul that was converted on the road to Damascus. You've got Paul who basically planted several churches around the around the area right go out and you know this was the call to the gentiles paul the apostle to the gentiles
right? Different than the, the ministry of Jesus Christ, which was to the Jews, which, by the way, when he ushered in the new covenant, then the ministry was to the Gentiles. Paul went out and planted churches. The disciples went out and preached to the Gentiles. We had, I mean, all of that. So the Great Commission, really, Tim Pruitt, the Great Commission couldn't happen today. So Paul didn't plant all of those churches. The disciples didn't preach to all of those Gentile churches. See, this is the thing now. They confuse, or they, I shouldn't say they confuse. They, they choose not to understand by saying things like that, that, that they minimize the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. They elevate the message of William Branham. They, they replace scripture. They replace the very word of God with doctrines which are taught by William Branham. And that's unacceptable. That's, we know that that's an entirely different Jesus Christ that they teach. So we just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. Look, we, I got this out pretty quickly. I know it's a little bit long today. We love you guys. We just really want you guys to, to have this stuff. We're not going to be doing a video for a little while now while I put together some of the research, but I did receive some of those video extracts, particularly the one from Tim Pruitt, and I wanted to share that with everybody and talk specifically about that. Be sure to check out the Facebook posts. Um, we, we love you guys. If there's anything you need, the end card at the end of this is going to have all of our contact information. We love the comments, even the ones that suggest that I didn't bring a hairbrush or I didn't do my hair. Sorry, that's that. You know, I can't see very well. So at the end of the day, you know, I'm kind of lucky that I'm sitting in front of the camera correctly. So, uh, but uh, God bless you. Send the comments in. We're happy to answer all the comments. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, feel free to let us know. Reach out and touch bases. We love you guys, and we'll see you later now. Bye-bye.